what's up, everybody? Welcome or welcome back to another great episode of Sensation Nation. Most of you may or may not know that October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and that just opens up many opportunities to talk about a lot of great things. Cyber is the sexy, cool word. Everyone talks about cyber, and everyone has a different definition of cyber. Depending upon who you talk to, you're going to get various definitions of cyber. Uh, I believe that with every great technological advancement comes an equal or greater vulnerability, and so we have to protect our cyber assets. So... Today's topic is talking about how complex cyber is, the complexities of cyber and the security challenges that come with that. I have a guest that I'm bringing on today that I'm super, super, super excited about because this young gentleman is really responsible for how my career started to take a different and positive trajectory. So most of you know that I am an officer, a cyber officer in the United States Air Force. I started my career off enlisted in the Marine Corps, then enlisted in the Air Force. And the person that I'm about to bring on actually helped to craft and sign my recommendation letter. You only get one. Uh, you you only get one. And this gentleman had happened to have crossed paths with me, not once, but twice, but he actually helped to put me on the path that I am today. So extremely thankful and grateful for that. So to help me talk about the complexity of cyber, I am bringing on my special favorite guest, Brigadier General Retired Gregory Tuhill. Now, he is retired from the Air Force, but he is not retired in the workforce. He is still out there doing it. He's still doing a lot of great things. While he wore the uniform, he had several jobs at various levels, Director of Command Control Communications and Cyber. He's been the Chief Information Officer at various levels. He has had numerous staff jobs commanded at the squadron, group, and wing levels, multiple distinguished graduate uh, awards that he received at various um, professional development courses, and just the list just goes on and on and on, and there was no way possible to take all of these accomplishments and put them on one page of a bio. I am surprised he was able to fit them on two, and I'm surprised they didn't go over into the third page. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sensation Nation, Brigadier General Retired, Gregory Tuhill. Hey, thanks very much there, Shooter. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and uh, with your audience. Uh, yeah. One thing you did mention is, is all those deployments. Uh, I, I know all the great places to eat downrange, too. You know? so. <laughs> Food is really important when you deploy downrange. You got to keep that morale up in some form of fashion. And what we put into our bodies and just to kind of keep us going and keep us happy is, is very, very important. Yep. And that's why the services career field is so dang important uh, to, to the mission. And, uh, that's right. But yeah, I, uh, I, I was very fortunate during my active duty military career to work with a lot of tremendous people, great people. And uh, one of my highlights was signing Tech Sergeant Sims's uh, application <laughs> to the training school. So, so proud of you. I'm yeah. so glad to see you continue to advance. And uh, for the audience, before we started, I said, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, uh, Major Sims here uh, spray paint silver onto those oak leaves because uh, he's recently been selected for promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Absolutely, sir. And I appreciate it. And uh, I, it really means a lot. So the fact that you and I are still staying in touch, it means a, a lot to me. And I, I hope to just continue to move forward and, and uh, I actually just make you proud for having put your ink on that letter. So, so uh, you, you're worthy. You're yes, worthy, sir. man. Thank you. So I, I kind of very uh, quickly summarized some some major highlights uh, from your biography. And I know that's kind of formal, the official, you know, things. And you've held a lot of great titles and done so many amazing things. But for the audience who, who may be familiar with the military, may not be, can you tell us a little bit about your background from your perspective, as well as your current roles and responsibilities today? Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm a I'm just a poor old country boy from Pittsburgh, and uh, when I uh, when I was a, a, a young young man, my my father said, you know, your mother and I really love you, but you're going to need to get a scholarship to go to college because we there were so many kids in our family, and uh, I, I am not the greatest of athletes. I'm not too bad, but I was never going to get an athletic scholarship. Uh, and back in the '70s. 
the ROTC scholarships were available. And I competed and uh, I was selected for Army, Navy, and Air Force. I decided to go Air Force because I thought Air Force provided a, a really great path uh, to the technology world, which was very appealing to me. I didn't really think about going to the academy because I didn't want to necessarily be a professional officer. I just wanted to, you know, serve for a while and then come, you know, get, get into the business world. And uh, I raised my hand and enlisted uh, in, April, let's see, September 6, 1979, I became Airman First Class Two Hill. Mm. And then shortly thereafter, I uh, got into ROTC and uh, became a cadet. And uh, since I raised my hand in 1979, I haven't let it drop. And uh, the, the Air Force surprised me in so many good ways. And I just decided to stay. And uh, I fell in love with my mission. I fell in love with my fellow airmen and my later, my soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines and Coasties and, and now guardians. And uh, I, you know, I, I continued to serve. And when it came time for me to leave uh, active duty, I was recruited to continue my service uh, at DHS and later in the White House. And uh, I did do my stint in the business world, and I was very successful there, but I didn't necessarily feel as connected to the mission. And when the job of uh, CERT director opened up at the Software Engineering Institute, I'd already been teaching at Carnegie Mellon University in the Heinz College for many years. Uh, but the CERT job is connected to the mission. And... Uh, when I was fortunate enough to be selected for that position, I felt like I've already, I've now hit the top of the pyramid for cyber professionals. And uh, now I'm in a position where I lead the, the, the world famous CERT uh, and just a brilliant team of cyber professionals who are at the top of their game. They have either invented it or they know those who have. And our mission is to support the so better securing the cyber domain so that the, the country can uh, be improved in terms of national security and uh, hardening and enhancing our national prosperity as well. Wow, that's a huge responsibility, sir, and, and an amazing journey just along your path. You know, one thing that you just said that I really liked a lot, never heard it phrased that way before, was that when you raised your hand, you'd never let it drop. I think that's pretty pretty amazing to hear and, and just I can actually kind of picture that. So you really still stand duty whether wearing a uniform or not. And I would imagine the same goes for cyber. Uh, you, you try to keep cyber up and you never let it drop. And you do that by protecting it and making sure that the security threats are not gonna harm uh, this nation's cybersecurity technological advancements. And so with that, uh, early on I mentioned about cyber. Cyber means so many different things to so many different people. Um, you, you go and talk to folks who have been around before technological advancements were ever invented. Uh, I can remember uh, a time where you know we didn't have all of the great technological advancements that we have today. So if something were to happen and I needed to open up a, an actual dictionary, I know how to look up a word without having to rely on Siri or Google and things like that. So uh, some, of us, some of us are lucky enough to be able to have seen it the way it was and to see it how it has become now. Now, when someone asks you what cyber is, what do you say and how do you respond to that? Well, I I was actually teaching yesterday, uh, and I, I tell my students that I consider cyber as the digital domain that humans create to share information with velocity and precision, period. Mm. Um, and if you think about it and you break that apart, you know, it's, it is a domain, <clears throat> uh, it, it's created by humans, unlike air, space, uh, land, et cetera. And its purpose is to share information. And then if you take a look at it, it, we're trying to share that information quickly. So with velocity, but also with a great deal of precision. So 
uh, that's why I, I use that definition of uh, cyber is the digital domain that humans create to share information with velocity and precision. Mm, I like it. I like it. And along along the lines of that, the way you just explained and described your definition of cyber, the thing that comes to my mind is the whole CIA triad, you know, confidentiality, mm -hmm. integrity, availability, you know, the things that we were taught way back when that still are in existence today. And yep. for those capabilities to be available for us to be able to share information uh, with one another, I would imagine uh, that is a lot to uphold, a lot to protect. So with that, in the business of cyber and cybersecurity, what do you describe or how do you describe cyber threats? What is a cyber threat to you? Well, um, a, a cyber threat I define as a person or a condition that jeopardizes our ability to maintain that confidentiality, integrity, and availability of digital resources. And, uh, you know, I can break that, uh, decompose that a little bit for you as well, you know, because frankly, there are people out there who, who are threats. And I can go through, you know, what, what those threats are a little bit later. But, you know, it, it can also be a condition. And a condition could be a flaw or a defect in a product. It could be uh, an external environmental condition. You know, you and I were stationed at Keesler Air Force Base, a uh, home of the hurricane hunters. You know, there's mm -hmm. uh, conditions as well that can jeopardize that confidentiality, in integrity, or availability of digital resources. And then further, you know, when, when you look at it, you know, I could easily say data or information, but I, I specify digital resources because... Ultimately, it, it goes beyond just the data and then the knowledge that's combined to form uh, information. You got to think in terms of the software, the hardware, and the wetware, the human element, as part of those resource packages that um, all come together as a team to form that digital realm that we call the cyber domain. Mm -hmm. Mm. You talk about uh, the threats and then the cyber cybersecurity aspect of it all, and um, I know you touched on the the external threats, and uh, you you mentioned the wet domain, you know, the human element as well. Um, I think that's also something that is probably you, uh, uh, something you've had to deal with, essentially the insider threat, right? Because um, the internal threat and external threat, they both can be detrimental to cyber and cybersecurity. Um, previously, you and I briefly in email talked about zero trust. Um, is zero trust something that can kind of get after the insider threat? Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that we do here at the Software Engineering Institute in the uh, CERT uh, division is, is that we actually have a practice of study uh, on insider threats, which we prefer to call insider risk, because a threat is usually associated with a deliberate hostile act, whereas a risk really gets down to the, the crux of the matter. Uh, you can have an insider risk because somebody carelessly does something that could expose uh, your information, could compromise that confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Uh, is is that a risk or is that a threat when it's done unconsciously or by accident? We prefer to call it uh, insider risk. And, uh, you know, one thing that we do on behalf of the Department of Defense and, and the U.S. government is we actually host the National Threat uh, Insider Threat Conference every year. And uh, we do have a whole practice of study and research and applied research on that. But as you take a look at what we are trying to do in the digital domain, you have to factor in that life is full of risk. And the whole goal is to get your job done with the minimum amount of cost and the best management of risk. And I think that's something that all of us cyber professionals need to keep in mind. You mentioned um, at one point, uh, 
the complexity of cybersecurity, which is exactly what we're talking about today. Uh, there's a quote I, I, I'll have to look up who is attributed to, and um, of course I'm paraphrasing, but uh, it goes something to the extent of keep things as simple as possible, but no more simple than that. Um, and, and cyber is not something that some people view as simple. Uh, you know, the whole kiss, keep, keep it simple, stupid. It, it is not simple to some people. Uh, in fact, cyber can be very complex to, to, certain, to a certain extent. Um, so you essentially identify complexity as today's biggest cyber threat. Why is that? Yep. Well, uh, this was gonna be a little bit long answer because I'm gonna unpack a lot here in a short period of time. First of all, complexity is the bane of security and simplicity is the arch nemesis of our adversaries. Um, the, the more complex you make it, the easier it is to break it is another quick uh, buzz phrase for folks. And as we take, uh, take a look at the, the threat environment that's out there, um, you know, we've got to make it simpler. Uh, for our operators, for our users, uh, for organizations and processes. Uh, we need to streamline and be effective, efficient, and secure. Uh, getting back to that zero trust question from before, you know, ultimately, zero trust is a security strategy. It's not something you buy. It's not a piece of hardware or software. It's a strategy. And, uh, you know, I articulate to my students and my colleagues that ultimately at zero, you know, from a zero trust standpoint, the, the, what you're trying to achieve is that Greg can only see what Greg is authorized and under certain conditions and entitlements. You know, if I'm logging in in the office on a issued device from the, the Software Engineering Institute, I should be able to see uh, the, the following information. Blah, 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 you know, that has been well defined. And then further, if I am, you know, traveling and I'm plugged into, uh, you know, hotel Wi Fi or uh, wherever, I should uh, have the conditions and the entitlement should match based upon the risk to the organization and that information. Uh, zero trust, if done right, um, it is a strategic view of the starting point. Zero trust is the starting point, but it's not the destination. Zero trust is the starting point on the road to digital trust. And uh, as we take a look with our research here at the CERT, we continually see uh, products and capabilities that are so complex that they introduce more risk, arguably, than most folks would understand. And when we do the research, we uh, see that uh, over 95% of the major incidents that uh, generate an incident response, over 95% are not caused by the typical threat actors that you would think that are out there, but rather uh, they're caused by careless, negligent, indifferent, or confounded people. And uh, that could be folks misconfiguring a, a system or not, in, not installing it properly or not patching in a timely manner. And if you continue to pull the thread down, a lot of the products are shipped with defects uh, because of poor software engineering and uh, poor product development processes that permit vulnerabilities to be uh, embedded in code and in products as they are shipped. Uh, I like to pick on one particular product where when I was still uh, in government service and uh, before that in the military, the, the salespeople for this uh, very well-known company would come in and say, hey, I've got this Great product. It's got seven layers of security in it, and it'll, you know, it'll stop the bad guys dead and won't, you know, protect your networks. But it takes about eighteen months for a already skilled tech, uh, technical staff member to get trained and certified in the proper use of that product. 
Mm. And then when I would uh, I would point out to the salespeople, I'd say, hey, look, I've got an airman on a four year enlistment. I'm sending them to basic training, which is 90 days. I send them to their technical training, which could last from six to 10 months. They've got on the job training. By the time I get them out of that initial pipeline uh, of training, now I go in and put specialty training like what you're offering. Uh, that adds 18 months to a, 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 a career of four years. They've got six months of productivity, and they've got to make a decision during that time whether to re-enlist or not. Products that take that long and they're that complex to use are actually harming the, our ability to better protect our national security and national prosperity. And as we take a look at uh, the, the amount of vulnerabilities that continue to be introduced in the marketplace, companies really ought to be taking a really good introspective look into the quality of their products in terms of security and uh, really need to embrace things like uh, DevSecOps and modern software development uh, techniques to better uh, produce products that are secure by design and secure by default. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all you have to do is wait for Patch Tuesday and get see the tsunami wave of defects that keep on coming in. And it's not just uh, Microsoft, it's across the entire information enterprise. Everybody can do better. And uh, here at the, the Software Engineering Institute, we believe that DevSecOps and a, a disciplined software development lifecycle is part of the solution set. But we also need to recognize that uh, we've got to factor in the human impacts of any hardware or software product. So I really do think that cybersecurity is a confluence of software, hardware, and wetware all coming together to better protect our national security and national prosperity. I like it. The human aspect is extremely detrimental. Uh, I always, almost in every other episode, I'm talking about people first, mission always. It takes people to do the mission and without the people, uh, you know, you just, you just putting yourself in a bad position overall. So simplicity and security sounds like an extremely delicate balance to try to make sure that we can get after the things that we need to get after. And our adversaries are coming after us left and right daily, zero day of vulnerabilities, things that we just kind of have to stay on top of. And it's not easy in the time that it takes to train our technicians to try to be able to counter those threats. Yeah, and let me put an exclamation point on that because you know the, the code itself should be complex to some extent, but the the code should be designed to lift the yoke of burden from the shoulders of the users and the operators and keep the complexity in the code. And with DevSecOps and some of the uh, software development lifecycle advancements that the Institute has really been on the tip of the spear in developing and creating, um, I, I really think that We've got a path forward that we can follow uh, to do better, but we have to keep the human in mind and taking that complexity off the shoulders of the, the humans should be the goal of a lot of the designers and the developers and the, the folks that are putting together capabilities that they want to take to the marketplace. Absolutely. And it's you, you're you making me, again, taking this trip down memory lane from my basic communication officer training days. And I think of the whole OSI model and all the levels of security that have to be uh, provided. And, you know, I, I, I remember the acronym, please do not throw sausage pizza away. You got the physical data link, uh, the 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 network layer, the transport session presentation and access layers. From, from the top to bottom, bottom to top, you know, there is a need for security at every layer of that OSI model, and it is not an easy feat. Yeah, and the, in the other direction, it's all, all people seem to need daily pizza. Uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's things that get stuck in our heads that, that last with us for a lifetime. Uh, so, sir, I, uh, 
I mentioned this earlier, and, and I guess I'll articulate it once more. Uh, I still believe that with uh, every technological advancement comes an equal or greater vulnerability. So we get all these new, fancy, shiny, cool things uh, that help make our lives easier. But I believe what comes with that is another challenge to secure it. Do you agree or disagree with that? Um, it, it's very uh, provocative. Uh, but no, I don't necessarily agree that it's an equal to or greater vulnerability. It doesn't have to be. So I, I challenge you as well as uh, those in the audience to really think about things in terms of risk as opposed to vulnerabilities, because ultimately I want, I'm taking a look at the effects. And uh, you know, as a senior U.S. military official, I had uh, one lens. As I was a senior government official, I had a, a slightly different lens. And as a senior executive in the business world, and I've served on boards and been a chairman of a board, and, you know, it, it, it's a it's a different lens there as well. Uh, so, the the vulnerabilities are always going to change, uh, but ultimately, I'm looking at the effects and the risks that are out there. So, techno technological advancement may change the calculus on the risk and the effects in a greater amount than the vulnerability itself. And vulnerable to what is uh, one of the big questions you need to ask. And certainly in, in the boardrooms of America and the boardrooms around the world, uh, as well as the, the boardrooms in government and the boardrooms in the military, you're balancing risk and effects uh, against those vulnerabilities. And what may appear to be a very small vulnerability to a designer may be a great vulnerability to a operator in the field. On the same token, um, the obverse is, may be true as well. Something that may be considered a, a great vulnerability by an operator may be viewed as a minor vulnerability or risk exposure by a board. Uh, so it, it really is contextual. Um, but I think as you know, as you take a look at things, with every technological advancement, you have to assess your risk against the effects you want to get out of that technological advancement. Mm -hmm. And you really do, really do have to apply a, uh, a risk management uh, uh, analysis. Anytime you are inserting a new technology, a new process, new procedures, et cetera. So no, I don't necessarily agree with that blanket statement, mm -hmm. but I think going in the right direction, um, as long as you factor in the risk part of it as well. Oh, that's very, very insightful. Uh, taking the risk into consideration and wondering and asking yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze really? If it boils down to, yeah. are you actually getting what you need out of it? And am I willing to accept risk X in order to provide service Y to populace Z? And if the answer is yes, I can accept that risk. Then uh, it sounds to me that you can move forward with it. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that's really interesting in today's uh, environment is the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, we've got the generative AI. We're doing an awful lot at Carnegie Mellon in that realm. Uh, and, you know, our, our uh, folks on campus, on the main uh, main part of campus that are doing the fundamental research uh, stuff, you know, we work very closely hand in, hand in uh, glove with them. Uh, they are really uh, advancing that discipline at warp speed. And uh, we who deal uh, primarily in the applied research, uh, we're advancing at high velocity and precision as well on that. I think as we take a look forward, AI for cyber and cyber for AI is something that we are cooking on gas with right now. Mm, mm. Uh, and there's, the, there's new products and capabilities coming into the marketplace that people really need to be paying attention to. And uh, beware the marketing glitz because not all are equal and not all are uh, advancing the state of the discipline as they may articulate. Uh, we're, we're also doing work on AI for Tessa Naval and Tessa Naval for AI, mm -hmm. because 
you know, you, you need to have some sort of constructs evaluating some of these products and capabilities as they're coming into the marketplace. Uh, but at, at their heart, the cybersecurity of AI is the same as cybersecurity uh, from every other computer system, mm. every other software system and the like, because these are just like computer systems and clouds on steroids. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the lessons learned from the, the first and arguably greatest hacker of all time. Uh, and it wasn't Kevin Mitnick who just passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. I argue that it is James T. Kirk because, mm. you know, who else hacked into the Starfleet com computers in the Kobayashi Maru? Who else knew the, that Khan wouldn't change the default password on the USS Reliant? You know, I think as we take a look at where we are going, um, the cyber domain is going to continue to grow in uh, impact on everybody's lives. And uh, it's it's necessary to have professionals uh, in the cyber domain who make sure that that confidentiality of data, the integrity of the data, and the availability of the systems and the data is is always going to be there in a in a manner that we will accept the risks and uh, ha get to a level of digital trust towards. And I think the threats that are out there today, the you know we can talk all these different code names for different nation state actors, but ultimately, I, I think you've got six major threat groups that are never going to really go away. I think you got folks uh, that are going to continue to vandalize. So vandals, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're still going to have crooks, the, the burglars who are trying to get a financial gain. I think you're still going to have muggers out there. And a great example is, uh, you know, what happened during the Sony breach. You know, hey, don't put out that movie. Don't put out that movie. Right. Don't put out that movie. Oh, okay, you put out that movie. We're going to mug you. That's right. But, you know. You can see uh, kids in middle school and high school that are doing cyber mugging as well and character assassinations of their classmates. That's bad stuff, and that's a threat. Uh, so muggers are out there. You're still going to have spies, and those could be the nation state actors. They could be industrial, you know, industrial spies who are trying to get a competitive advantage in the marketplace. You're going to have saboteurs, the threat of saboteurs, and we usually think of that as insider threats, but it could also be down in the supply chain where you have somebody who does something nefarious or stupid in the uh, supply chain. Uh, so those are the, the top five that everybody thinks about. But really, as I take a look at the statistics, 95% are caused you know, by careless, negligent, indifferent, or confounded people that are overwhelmed by the complexity of our products and our processes, and uh, we can do better. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do uh, here at the Software Engineering Institute and the, the CERT division is to help folks be better in the domain and through our practices in cybersecurity engineering and resilience, uh, you know, as a team, we are trying to make the conditions better for everybody. Mm, very good. This is good, sir. This has been very helpful, especially hearing those those categories of, of bad actors out there. You know, what I what I take away uh, from this, I think the bumper sticker for me is complexity is the enemy of cybersecurity. And the more simple we can make things, the better we can basically arm our technicians out there our security professionals, the better we can arm them with being able to uh, protect our systems and, and our accesses. So Amen. this has been great, sir. Let's just say right now, before, before I let you go, I actually hate to let you go, but before I let you go, let's, let's just pretend right now you're, you're in a coffee shop and you're waiting for your coffee. And for some reason, the line's a little backed up and person X walks up to you. Person X in this case could be our listeners, our viewers out there. It could be uh, those middle schoolers that you were talking about that are learning all these new cyber tricks that are probably more advanced than we were at their ages. Um, person X could be more senior folks that are maybe a little afraid of cyber uh, because of the complexities of it. Um, various groups of people. Um, what final thoughts would you leave 
with person X if they were asking you anything about cyber, cybersecurity, whatever comes to your mind? What kind of last notes would you leave with them? Well, I think uh, at the, the start of the conversation, I would remind everybody that we are all workers uh, in the cyber domain. We're all citizens of that cyber uh, domain because today's uh, economies, the way we communicate, uh, e even using technologies like uh, we're using today to chat, uh, all are reliant on that cyber domain. And uh, all of us, regardless of which career path that we take, uh, have a hand and a stake in the cyber domain. Uh, so, you know, you don't necessarily need to be a cybersecurity engineer or, you know, a database administrator, a network engineer, a system administrator to understand your role in the cyber domain. Uh, some of those rules that uh, we learned as kids and all, uh, you know, I was a Cub Scout, like a lot of folks in my generation. You know, one of the, the, the motto of the Cub Scouts is do your best. And uh, when it comes to being a good uh, citizen in the cyber domain, do your best, do the right thing. Uh, read the instruction book, uh, take the time to read the instruction book. Uh, but uh, also if you're writing the instruction books, make them readable. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know I, I think as we, as we, as, uh, Digitally connected citizen, we all have a role to play in security. I tell my parents, who are not the digital natives uh, by any measure, uh, you know, we, we need to be guarding our privacy. We need to jealously guard uh, uh, concepts like civil rights and civil liberties uh, in the cyber domain, uh, because people don't necessarily think about privacy, civil rights and civil liberties in the cyber domain as they would through other discourse in society. Uh, I think it's really important that uh, we act as good citizens in the cyber domain, just as we would with our next door neighbors, our families, our friends, uh, and, and the social compact we have with others. I think once we uh, hit that grounding of treating people with dignity and respect in the cyber domain, good stuff starts to happen from there. And uh, reading the instruction book is always good regardless. You don't have to be a mathematician. You don't have to be a, a graduated engineer. You just have to do the right things and do your best. Do your best, people. Do your best. We can't ask more from you than that. Just simply do your best. I appreciate that, sir. One last thing. Uh, one thing in our society is, is we sometimes fail to ask for help because some people are thinking it's a sign of weakness. Asking for help is a sign of wisdom, not mm. of weakness. Mm. So, uh, when, when your best, if you feel your best isn't good enough, ask for help. There's plenty of folks out there who uh, are willing to help. And, you know, for government agencies, for military organizations, my organization was created to be that place to ask for help. But uh, in, in your local neighborhood, there's lots of folks you can ask for help. If you're in school, ask your teachers for help. If you're in business, there's actually folks uh, who have cyber oriented businesses. There's professional organizations like ISC Squared and ISACA. Uh, there's lots of folks out there who can help you. Mm. All you have to do is ask. I like those two things. And if I take do your best and ask for help and I smash them together, um, I think it creates a, a perfect formula of you don't always have to be the smartest person in the room. You just have to know who they are. And if you, if you can capitalize on that, I think that it's a win-win for everybody. Amen. Sir, before I let you go, my very final thing that I, I always end each and every episode with is a fun 10-question quick round. I shoot questions at you. And, and for Lightning the audience, round. By, the, by the way, he has not seen these questions. Uh, so I'm going to throw them at you, sir. Are you ready? I'm ready. Bring it. Number, number one, when it comes to tea, I know you're from Pennsylvania. Do you prefer sweet tea or unsweet tea? Unsweet. Unsweet. Number two, greatest boxer, Ali or Tyson? 
Ali. Number three, movies. Star Wars or Game of Thrones? Star Wars. Number four, when it comes to fitness, I know you work out and you still fit into your uniform, which we already talked about. Do you prefer the treadmill or track? Uh, treadmill now. Okay. Uh, number five, libations, if you partake. Uh, so none of the above is quite all right. Uh, neat or on the rocks? Rocks. Number six, work. Telework or in the office work? In the office. Number seven, travel. Would you rather take a cruise or be in one spot at an all-inclusive? Ooh. <laughs> Look, I, I'd have to ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a smart answer. I like that. That's probably the answer for almost all of these, actually. <laughs> Number eight, villains, Joker or Darth Vader? Vader. Number nine, music, live or pre-recorded? Pre-recorded. Awesome. And 10, last but not least, when it comes to chicken wings, do you prefer flats or do you prefer the drums? Ooh, uh, <laughs> drums. Drums. Drums it is. Sir, thank you for playing along. I always like to end each episode with something quick and fun. Uh, before I let you go, sir, I want to say thank you for your time. I know that you are a very busy man, so I want to say uh, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate um, the efforts that you have done in the cyber community, the military community, and personally for me. Well, you are worthy, my friend. And I am so, uh, so proud to have uh, served alongside you, and I'm so proud of your accomplishments as you continue your efforts to protect us all. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in with us. Until next time on Sensation Nation, I'm out.